Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is Sunday, the 11th of April of 2021, and I'm going to be discussing two different articles where they describe all the adverse effects of fluid, basically volume overload from fluid resuscitation. I have a very, very passionate, I guess you could say, obsession about not over resuscitating my patients. And perhaps I even said that wrong, but I'm going to stick with it. Historically, when resuscitating patients who have sepsis and septic shock, you know, one of the thought processes before was that these patients were extremely volume depleted and you just needed to give them liter after liter of fluids. In the early goal directed therapy study by Rivers and his colleagues, these patients got up to nine liters of fluids, which today when we're using other measures to determine fluid responsiveness and volume responsiveness, this this amount of fluids just seems a little bit preposterous, but nonetheless, that's what the data said before, and we're we're honestly getting better with this. But that being said, we still need to make some strides to continue to improve on how we resuscitate our patients. I say this because to this day, we still see clinicians out there who state that patients who are in sepsis or septic shock or hypotensive need a ton of IV fluids, so much so that you know, they say, oh, if they end up needing to go on the ventilator because they get pulmonary edema, well, then so be it. We'll just put them on a ventilator. And I happen to disagree with this actual notion to to the extent where I'm actually recording this podcast. Let's let's be completely honest here. And so the two journal articles that I'm going to be using as a citation for this paper or for this podcast, excuse me, are listed in the show notes. And the first one, which the image of the Michelin man that many of you may have seen in my Instagram post that was actually put out today as well. Well, that particular paper was titled Principles of Fluid Management and Stewardship in Septic Shock. It's time to consider the four Ds and the four phases of fluid therapy, which was published by Malbrain and his colleagues in the Annals of Intensive Care. And then this particular paper is free for you to download, and I definitely recommend you check it out for yourself. Now, the other paper, the one that came out more recently and was published in CHEST, came out just a couple of weeks ago on April 1st of 2021, and it is titled Dosing Fluids in Early Septic Shock. And I plan on doing a substantial more, a substantial amount of more content based on this, this particular paper, as well as other papers on fluid responsiveness and volume resuscitation. But stay tuned and subscribe and all that good stuff so that you don't miss out on any of the podcasts on this, on this topic. Some of the key factors that are thrown out constantly in the literature include the fact that only 50% of critically ill patients are fluid responsive. In addition to that, 66% of patients who receive fluids for septic shock are by definition volume overloaded on hospital day one. So that means that chances are they were overly resuscitated. And I've already talked, spoken about this in the past. And again, for those of you who are hearing it again, probably hopefully will help ingrade this in your brain. But even in a healthy person, if they get a liter of fluid, 68% of that fluid will be extravasated into the interstitium within the first hour. And then in patients who are critically ill, approximately 80% of it is extravasated in 30 minutes. So, you know, just giving people arbitrarily fluids is is honestly short-lived. Yeah, it'll make the blood pressure look better for a little bit, but uh, it's not really going to do the do right for our patient. And again, I've, I've covered this in the past. So moving on to the whole topic of this podcast, which is the reasons why giving patients too much fluid is deleterious to their, to their actual well-being and their recovery is because it honestly alters so many different organ systems from the respiratory system, hepatic system, GI tract, the abdominal wall, the kidneys, cardiovascular, as well as the central nervous system. Many of us just go ahead and focus on the respiratory system, which is what I'm going to dive into first. But when you start considering how fluid overload deleteriously affects these other systems, it'll make you second guess why you're giving a patient liter after liter after liter of fluids when in fact it's not actually helping out the outcomes you might actually be causing harm in these patients. Starting off the respiratory tract, Again, going back to that concept of give patients so much fluid that they eventually need to go on a ventilator, well, that's just the pulmonary edema that you're causing because, of course, you're you're basically translocating this fluid into the actual lung tissue itself, and so you develop pulmonary edema. And then part of the problem is that many patients will go ahead and develop pleural effusions because of this. 
then that's going to go ahead and make it a little bit difficult at the, at the tail end of the patient's recovery to get them off the ventilator because they're going to need procedures such as thoracentesis or additional diuresis to be able to mitigate the effects of these pleural effusions and get rid of them. These patients also, because of their pulmonary edema and other, other factors, they become harder to oxygenate. Then in turn, they also become harder to ventilate. And you notice that their PaCO2 starts to increase. And their PF ratio, which is the ratio of PaO2 over FiO2, just starts to decrease as well. You know, because of this pleural fusion, you also have decreased lung volumes. It makes it harder to get patients off the ventilator again because you have to diarrhea them and they're harder to oxygenate and ventilate. So this leads to prolonged ventilation. It also makes it harder to get patients off the ventilator and increases their work of breathing. All these things just because one may have gone too far with giving fluid resuscitation. But then we move down to the abdominal cavity where you notice that these patients tend to form ascites, especially if they come in with you know, hypoalbuminemia on presentation or they're malnourished or whatnot. It makes it easier to form this, this ascites, especially if you're resuscitating somebody who has, for example, underlying cirrhosis or fatty liver disease. Then they also have this increase in gut edema. And then we, I focus hard on nutrition in our critically ill patients. But when you have this gut edema, it also leads to malabsorption of the nutrients. This leads to other, other issues um, with the patient's recovery. Patients also could de develop an ileus or decreased bowel contractility. And one of the things that we kind of ignore to a certain extent is the intra-abdominal pressures. So it just, it's just really deleterious to our patients. It makes it harder for them to tolerate enteral feeding. It makes it easier for the bacteria in your gut to translocate. And again, all these things are just negative effects that one can see from over-resuscitating our patients. Carrying on with the intra-abdominal space, I don't know about you, but I take care of a lot of patients in our surgical ICU who, for example, had some intra-abdominal catastrophe, which... I'm trying to get the patient over their shock portion of it and allow them to heal. But if these patients get too much fluids, and again, there, there was a recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago where they looked at conservative versus liberal IV fluids for intra-abdominal catastrophes, and liberal fluids did better in that, in that patient subgroup. But again, that doesn't mean you should, and again, it, it all depends on the definitions of what liberal and conservative fluid therapy means. But take a look at the parameters that were that were used in that study but nonetheless when i get a patient with an intra-abdominal catastrophe that sometimes the, the the abdomen needs to be left open or is just approximated slightly or is fully closed you have to be careful with the tissue edema that happens around the actual wound itself because this could actually lead to poor wound healing and therefore you could get infections on that on that actual tissue and, you know, those are not things you want for your patients because then it makes it hard for them to move around and they can develop more pressure ulcers and it's, it just becomes a mess. From a hepatic standpoint, you do see increased hepatic congestion when you give patients too much IV fluids. And this could be secondary to patients going into right heart overload. And then that obviously has a downstream effect to create this hepatic congestion. And this is where you see patients who have impaired synthetic function um, you know, they're not correcting their, under, they're not making the, the procoagulant factors. And you might see that their INR is starting to increase. And then on top of that, their LFTs are just a little bit elevated, like the ASC and ALT. And that could be secondary to, you know, giving too much IV fluids. Patients could develop cholestasis. They could develop hepatic compartment syndrome and things of that nature. So one of the ways that, one of the philosophies that pe people have of giving IV fluids is to make the kidneys happy. But this is not always the case. And the reason why is because when you have, for example, edema of your respiratory tract, of your uh, intra-abdominal organs and things of that nature, the kidneys also develop interstitial edema. And therefore, the renal, renal venous pressure also increases, which in turn actually decreases the renal blood flow. So you might say to yourself, hey, you know, I'm going to give them more fluid so they can get more renal blood flow. But you're actually doing the opposite as the interstitial pressure of the kidneys actually increases. And the GFR decreases and, and the patient's kidneys just do not do well. So this whole thought process of, oh, the, kid the patient's not making urine, let's go ahead and give them more fluid. Well, that doesn't really work that way. And that's a concept we kind of need to hammer out of
the whole philosophy of how to resuscitate patients. It's not necessarily the case. Now, from a standpoint of the central nervous system, this is something that I personally had not given sufficient thought to, where patients could go ahead and develop cerebral edema, impaired cognition. They also could have delirium. And, you know, this could decrease the the cerebral perfusion pressures and could increase intraocular pressures. That's something that I personally miss out on. I, I don't think about it enough, but it's something that actually happens to our patients. And they also have an increase in their intracranial pressures. So these, these different components, all of it needs to be taken into account when resuscitating our patients to not overdo. Last, but definitely not least, I'm going to dive into the whole cardiovascular impacts of having volume overload. And again, many people, including myself at one point, again, I wasn't born knowing these things. I've had to read it along the way. And this is part of our journey that we're going on together to become better, uh, better doctors, NPs, PAs, nurses, uh, CRNAs, everybody, all of us, we're working to get better at taking care of our patients. And from the cardiovascular standpoint, there's more edema in the actual myocardio itself. And what this does is this actually leads to conduction disturbances. Like the electricity does not move around the heart the way it should. I know that's not the terminology that would make the cardiologist happy, but again, I'm just trying to convey the importance of thinking of this myocardial edema. And then there's also impaired contractility of this myocardium because it's edematous. And these patients go ahead and they, they develop diastolic dysfunction because everything just becomes stiff. In turn, you see that there's an increase in the CVP, which, again, I personally do not like to use CVP in isolation ever. Um, and there's also an increase in the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, which is also caused, called, excuse me, the wedge pressure. And again, I do not float swans routinely in my septic shock patients. But you do end up seeing a decrease in the venous, venous return when your volume overloaded. You also see a de decrease in the stroke volume, and you also see a decrease in the cardiac output. And again, the whole premise of giving patients fluid is to go ahead and increase their cardiac output. So by overdoing it, you actually decrease the cardiac output because it's basically like you're putting a large weight. Like let's say you're trying to curl, uh, let's say you're at the gym and you, you know you could curl a five pound weight without any problems, but imagine it being changed to a 50 pound weight. Well, you're, you're not going to be able to contract that. You're not going to be able to go ahead and lift that. So giving patients too much fluids yeah, at first, when you start resuscitating a patient who's actually fluid responsive, you will see an increase in your cardiac output. But there, there comes a time where it's not going to increase your cardiac output because, again, you've already put too much load on the heart itself and it's not going to be able to contract well. And then if you keep on giving patients fluids after your cardiac output is already stagnant, well, in that case, all you're doing is causing harm to your patients. And that's that's definitely not why you signed up to be in the medical profession, not to actually like harm patients. But you end up seeing this myocardial depression. And in some patients, you could go ahead and see a pericardial effusion. And these are not things that you want to do for your patient. Overall, this kind of sums up this fantastic article and image that, again, I definitely recommend that you read it for yourself and not trust me. That's my disclaimer all the time. This is not medical advice on how you should manage your patients. But at the same time, something you should use to consider how to be better at taking care of these patients and to not cause harm. So thanks so much for checking out my podcast, wherever you're listening to it. I appreciate your support. Have a great day, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye.